when you look at children that have uh, language impairments, uh, you, you commonly see that their processor has been adapted or adjusted just as you would expect it to be adapted or adjusted if the language model were noisy. So th to cite several specific pieces of evidence, look in the brain of a child at six months of age and look at how it responds to rapidly successive stimuli or look at how it responds specifically to ph phonemic stimuli as it's creating its selective specific phonemic representations that, are, that characterize its native language. And you see that it's defective in exactly the right ways. It misses those pieces of the speech, you could say, and it's adjusted its processor exactly as you'd expect it to be adjusted if the problem is a problem of signal to noise and representation of the language. The second example, create a computational model of a self-organizing brain and say, what would, it, what would it be in the self-organizing brain that would contribute to the specific defects you see in the language operations of the child? And how you create that model is by simply adding noise, by simply making the noise, the speech model, noisy. I'll take a third example. A third example is to look in an animal and give an animal a history of a noisy brain and then see how it adjusts its processors, its processing machinery, how it sets its time constants, how it sets its space constants as it processes complex acoustic information. And it does it exactly the way the brain of a child does it in, that it, in ways that account for its defective speech listening. So there's actually very powerful evidence that at least in many children that are slow to learn language, the problem is a true delay in the development of a processing of their native language that leaves them with a defective language. And their process is actually idealized, not for English or Spanish, but for noisy English or noisy Spanish. And it turns out that that, that defect, that limitation, is actually powerfully addressable plastically at any point later in life. You can see that in an animal, you can see that in a, in a kid. So that's an example of, un, from the basis of understanding the neurology, of the failure modes of the self-organizing brain or machine, understanding the, 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 and documenting the specific changes that occur in the brains of children that are struggling, you begin to see how, what accounts for the struggle begin to see what accounts specifically for their difficulties, but you also have great insights into how to potentially correct it. And that's basically the kind of strategy that we apply in looking for these specific scenarios that might account for a substantial general weakness in children that are struggling. Did that make sense at all? It did to me. Uh, you can actually create a speech model. You can first measure the time constant in a child or in an adult with this history and you can create a speech model and say, well, if, if, if you, I represent speech by a processor that operates with this sampling rate, how clearly, how intelligible is it to a normal hearing individual? And for the majority of these children, it is very poorly intelligible, has very limited intelligibility. That's another way of saying that they're not extracting information from the speech input stream in the way a normal child is. Now, it turns out that that dimension, we've shown in many experiments, that dimension of sound representation is plastic. I can take you or, or a monkey or a rat or, uh, or a child with such a problem or a normal child and improve it. In fact, I can not only improve it, if, if I can degrade it. I can change it positively or negatively, it's plastic. I can change, I can make such distinctions about such stimuli very important to the brain by controlling behavioral context and generally I can drive improvements in it. When I do that, the speech is represented, you could say, in a clearer way. It's represented to the brain in a more salient form. And there are a variety of points of evidence that demonstrate that you do exactly that in such a child. Now you can look in the brain and you see the time constant is more normal. Now when you look in the brain, you see that the way the brain represents information is more powerful. It's representing it more coherently, sort of event by event, as the intrasyllabic information flows by. It's representing in higher fidelity. And then every operation the brain makes with it is enabled by that. In other words, for a memory system, if the information flowing into the brain is represented in a non-salient way, it means that the capacity of the brain to, to encode it, to record it, is degraded. If I refine it, if I strengthen it, I strengthen the capacity of the brain to record it reliably as a memory. So there are a so whole series, you could say, of downstream important crucial downstream consequences that occur from having a clear signal in. 
This really goes back to the basic arguments that were made at the early era of the study of dyslexia by Isabel Lieberman and others, who argued that the fundamental problem is the degraded, degraded way in which the speech represents this crucial phonemic information. It is representing it in a fundamentally degraded way, and, but it's subject to refinement. You could say the engrams, or the stored representations of information that are the basis of remembering and using them, are in a fuzzy or degraded form, an old idea. And that's exactly what we believe is happening. And we believe it's happening because the speech model in such a brain is just not up to, not up to par. In the early life of a child, it's noisy. It's degraded. A brain that represents speech based upon a muffled model generates an ideal processor for processing muffled speech. Sometimes we use an analogy to, to get at this, um, an analogy of the player piano where the code that we're reading with is analogous to the code that's on the scroll used by the player piano. As if, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. ultimately, it kind of comes down to, do we have the right number of keys? Is each key making yeah, it sound yeah. correctly? Can the keys yeah. be played together in chords? Is the piano out of tune? If the keys the code is assuming will be played aren't working right, if they stick together, the yeah. sound ends up muddled yeah. instead of a, playing a clear, comprehensible stream right. like the code intended. Yeah, one of the, that's a very nice analogy. And one of the ways to think about it is, and as, as psychologists and neuroscientists have thought about these problems for a long, for a long time, they've isolated these, the sort of sub-problems that apply to a dyslexic or language-impaired child. So, for example, they might say in relation to a player piano analogy, they might say, well, we will define this as a problem, a child might have a problem of syntax. That is to say, of reliably relating what sound belongs with what sound on the incoming speech stream and making all the correct sort of online assumptions and, and relationships. All of those relationships, all ways in which you use information that you're receiving is dependent upon signal quality. It's all dependent upon how sharply, how crisply, how strongly, how effectively, how, how reliably the brain represents little, little pieces of, of sound flowing in, you could say. And so, so if you have a fault at the bottom of this chain, then you have a problem with everything. Okay, and that's fundamentally what, 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 what the problem is. Now, I want to just say one thing farther about this. In a sense, another way that people fail to confuse themselves about this is that they truly do imagine that there can be a fault at the bottom of the chain without a fault everywhere. Or they imagine there could be a fault at the top of the chain without a fault at the bottom. This is wrong. Because, in fact, no part of a, of a language system operates in isolation of any other part. Faults are shared, right? If you have a fault at the top, you have a fault at the bottom and vice versa. They're co-implicated. They're co-implicated. So there's a common argument that it, there, can be, there can be truly a deficit in something like your ability to, to know, to devolve a word into its sound parts and to recognize that it has those parts. But in fact, a brain that does that reliably and normally uh, has adequate processing all across its operational system by necessity, and a brain that fails to do that reliably is expressing a problem of fa a failure in operation of the brain all across its operational system. They're complexly interconnected top to bottom and bottom to not top, and you cannot really think of them as operating in isolation. Fallacy.